I'm Alyssa. And I'm Javis Flores. And we're here interviewing Mike Kennedy. I watched one of your old interviews, yeah. older interviews, and it was talking about how your uncle would send you comic books mm -hmm. while he was in the military. Do you know where he was stationed? Yeah, at first uh, he was in, the, in Korea uh, during the 1960s. And about every three or four months, I'd get a shoebox in the mail, and there would be all, nothing, no Marvel or no DCs. He found some really weird comics, so that's what I was first introduced to. And then, uh, then I started getting into Marvel comics, you know, standards, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Avengers, and all of that. Uh, and then he got stationed in Japan for like 17 years, so occasionally I get a box full of, of manga. And I mean, the old school stuff like Astro Boy, nothing what we see today. Uh, didn't understand a single bit of it, but I really liked the cool art. Was there any particular hero or comic you liked a lot? Oh God, no, I wanted to read everything. Anything that, anything that they put in front of me, I read it. When you started getting your profession, um, what, did you think it was going to get you this far ahead? Oh, yeah. I, actually, I really... You know, being bold, I really thought I'd be a lot further. But that's okay. I, the path I took, I like. Uh, I've got uh, more freedom with what I do project-wise. I get to pick and choose what I do, which is kind of cool. Uh, I've done some books just from reading one page of the script. And I thought, well, that's a cool idea. I'll do that. And uh, the Celtic Knight series is a, a key benefit from that. I read the first two pages of the script for issue number one and told him I was in. He goes, how far did you get? I said, two pages. I'm sold. And so, you know, and that we worked together uh, for seven years before he passed away, my writer. But he wrote so much material. I've got tons of work to still do with his. And then I've also gone in back into writing as well. And I'm writing in uh, timeline fillers because some of the stuff, there's some weird gaps. <laughs> so I decided to start doing little uh, fill-in stories to kind of kind of tie everything together. Because he started out with a really cool group of villains and then never heard from again. First, very first comic I did my junior year of high school. There was a writing contest, uh, and I just didn't want to write. I wanted to write and draw. So I drew this uh, really, uh, if I look at it now, it's a really terrible book called The Celestial Man. And it won an award. Uh, they had to create a, an award for it for illustrated story. So I thought that was pretty cool. I liked it. They must have liked it, or I wouldn't have got the award. Um, and so, uh, against the better judgments of my art teacher, sorry, who did not like comic books, she didn't, you'll never go anywhere with it. I said, well, well, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. You know, I've done 30 plus books. I've done spot illustrations, uh, covers. I've got the chance to actually just color uh, graphic novels. So, and get paid for it, which was even better, you know. Uh, that, which is the biggest downfall for independent comic or uh, independent illustrators. You sometimes do a lot of books on spec. Never do that unless you just really believe in the project. I've not made a huge amount of money as a comic artist, but I've had a lot of fun, you know. And I've always had a regular job to pay the bills. Uh, I have a friend uh, lives in Oklahoma City who was actually a student of mine at one time. Uh, I used to teach commercial art in a technical school, and he graduated and went to work for a metal design company. That was his regular job, and then he went to every single convention with portfolios for years trying to pick up work. He didn't care. He didn't even want to get paid. He just wanted to do it because he loves it, and uh, he's actually got a couple paying jobs, and he's, he's gone to San Diego, uh, New York, Chicago. So I'm, there's a lot of people that know him, and he's, he's a pretty consistent artist. He's gotten better over time, uh, but his big deal is more technical, but he just loves comic books. When you were doing Celtic Nights, mm -hmm. um, I know that the scenery and stuff is a main part of comic books, just to be behind the characters so you mm -hmm. kind of get the feel of where they're at. Mm -hmm. How would you think of doing Ireland in that way. Well, that was Stephen's deal because he's from Dublin, uh, and so he, it, everything was him. But he kept it a very Americanized, so he didn't he didn't keep any dialect according to Ire to Ireland. So uh, 
it was very Americanized in the, in the voices, but the location was key. So I Googled tons and tons of photos and uh, Google Earth to do high-end uh, aerial scenes. And, you know, I tried to stay really true to it. So, you know, uh, in some I'm actually the books that are coming out at the end of the year, there's a few scenes where I just took actual uh, street shots from Dublin and then integrated the characters into it. So, you know, it, so, some people when they from Ireland, if they see it, they might see themselves in the street. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but I, I wanted to keep it very true. So, instead of just doing generic buildings, uh, and I picked that up from a guy, Scott McLeod. He did a book uh, many years ago called Destroy, and he spent three weeks in New York City taking pictures of all the buildings, and the end result of that is great photo reference. It was all his photo reference, and he destroyed every building in the book that he drew, essentially. So I thought if he can go that to that extent, I, I certainly can you know, step up to the, to, to the plate and do the same thing. What would you say to any young comic artist or want to be a comic artist? Um, practice your craft every single day, uh, whether it's for a project or not. Uh, sketchbook, sketch constantly, sketch everywhere. Uh, again, it kind of follows back to my, my friend Scott we were just talking about. He draws everywhere. His wife must hate him because she has to drive everywhere. And he gets to sketch the whole time. But when he goes, they go to New York twice a year, one for the Comic-Con just because they have friends up there. And you'll see sketches of, of uh, delis and shops in, in New York City. Uh, he's gone to Grand Central Station and sketched. So, uh, and I believe that. You should do that. You should draw all the time. Uh, I don't, as much as I used to, but at one point in time I drew eight hours a day regardless. Whether it was for anything or if it was just for ideas. Because uh, all you're doing is sharpening your craft. Uh, keep a good reference book library. I have probably 3,000 books, and the majority of them are all referenced by different artists from different time frames. Uh, I've got books going all the way back to the to the mid 1900s uh, that came out, and it just and it could be anything: bridges, buildings, airplanes, cars, people. Uh, there was a great uh, series called the Complete Figure Illustration Manuals. And essentially what they did is they took a model, put them on a turnstile, and they did one pose, and they shot a 360-degree reference. So you got every possible angle of the model. And that's a great book. Uh, you know, and if you're going to do comics specifically, don't get the new drawing the comic, comics of Marvel way. Get the old one, because it's better. Uh, sequential, uh, sequential Comics by Will Eisner, that's the Bible. Any major artist that does comics, Frank Miller, any of those guys, that's where they learn their craft. Draw all the time. You know, if there's a problem, fix it. Work on it. I always suffered horribly with hands and feet. Uh, matter of fact, first portfolio showed every guy and every character had clenched fists, and coincidentally, the end of the panel got the feet on. And so uh, after talking to a few publishers and they commented on it, I went back and that's all I did. That's all I did. I drew hands and feet until I got got it down. And I still mess them up every once in a while. And the same thing with faces. Uh, my classes right now are just finishing up portraits. And so I've gone through and taught them a multitude of steps. It's just learning all these different techniques, listening to your contemporaries. It's like, hey, I got this really cool book. It shows a lot of really neat ways of drawing this, this, and this. Go get it. Uh, I was taking a drawing and painting class two years ago and he showed me showed us all this really cool anatomy book by the time I got around the classroom I had already got on my phone already gone to Amazon and ordered it. Are there any of those the new Marvel movies or DC movies that you're a big fan of? Um, I like most of the Marvel movies. The DC ones uh, they just still aren't quite there. Still need to find their steps? Yeah I still think I you know I think they need to look at their competition and see how they're doing you know, of course, it'll be interesting to see uh, James Gunn's version of uh, Suicide, Squad. Suicide Squad. I think it will probably be much better. And then it was going to be nice to see him come back and do Guardians 3. Have you ever met any of your know, like, idols or icons? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I've gone to conventions off and on for over 30 years. Actually, if you grab that frame, I can show you something right there. Uh, I was just showing this to the class today. 
this was a convention I went to nine years ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And after the convention, all the artists went to the Adult Beverage Center in the hotel. And we just sat and talked and talked about art. We talked about everything. And so I took this picture on my phone. And you can tell how fuzzy it is, how old that phone is. Uh, and then I printed the picture off. And I just took it back to the show the next day and said, hey, guys, would you sign this for me? Because I really enjoyed our time together. And, and instead of not just the signatures, they all did a sketch for me. Which, you know, and one of the kids asked me if I'd ever sell it. And I said, no, this is a, this is a personal moment. Uh, you know, and it's kind of like that with a lot of these guys. Uh, the three or four times I met up Stan Lee, it was always a conversation. It was never just a signature and move on. Uh, my my thirtieth birthday, and I sold the story to my team. Uh, I was at a trade show, and Stan was there. And uh, coincidentally, the my birthday coincides with the release of the very first Spider-Man comic, to the date, to the year. And we were sitting in line waiting to meet Stan and. We were all talking about my birthday and everything, and the guy that was running around in the, at the trade show dressed as Spider-Man decided to hang out with us, and when I said all that, he grabbed me out of line, took me up to the very front, and said, hey, Stan, this guy's got the same birthday as me. So I got all this really cool signed swag from uh, Stan Lee and from John Romita Sr., who was there at the convention too. So I have his signature, and I've got a cool sketch from John Romita and then just all kinds of stuff they gave me. I've actually met John Byrne, I met Frank Miller uh, at, the, at the same convention back in 1982. I was sitting at John Byrne's booth getting tons of advice and uh, one of the senior editors at DC Comics came up and introduced himself to, to John and we were all talking. He says, hey, I want to meet, you, meet this kid. He's going to be, he's an up-and-comer and up comes a younger, ganglier uh, Frank Miller. So, and he had just, uh, the first issue of the Wolverine uh, miniseries had just come out, and I happened to have some in my uh, shoulder bag, being well prepared, but not unknown. So I got autographs from Frank Miller while I was sitting there talking to them. Met the guy who created the original Green Lantern comics back in the 1930s, uh, Martin O'Dell, super nice guy, really nice wife. We had, uh, we had dinner, yeah, we had dinner with them that night after the artist alley shut down for the day. You know, so it's just, it was, very few I haven't met. I feel like you may have a connection to Spider-Man. Yeah. How did you feel about Marvel was about to give up Spider-Man to Sony? Well, I think that was a stupid business mistake. But a lot of the times, and if you look at the information stuff, it was a financial decision on their part because they figured, you know, if you look at some of the other companies that they dealt with on their movies at first, you know, like New Line Cinema for Blade, uh, that horrible, never seen in the theater version of Fantastic Four by Roger Corman. They knew that Sony was going to have better distribution, bigger budgets, but the problem was they hadn't figured out their formula yet. So those, the, you know, first Sam Raimi movies were really kind of cheeky, kind of superhero-ish, uh, but they really got the, their feet on the ground when uh, Kevin Feige came in and they started listening to Marvel, seeing how successful their movies were over over theirs, and they had the major number one property in comics. I mean, you know, how can you script Spider-Man? Well, there's been a couple times. Uh, but I think when they came out with the, uh, the Spider-Verse and got the Academy Award for Best Animated Film, I think, you know, Marvel has, start, has started rubbing off on them, and they're realizing that, which is why when they had the big court, non-court non battle about uh, Marvel losing the rights to Spider-Man again, and Sony realizing that was probably not a smart move because they couldn't get any, they couldn't get access to the MCU characters anymore. So you know, when you've got Robert Downey Jr. making cameos in your movies, uh, you know, when they lose all that, and they were talking about rebooting again, you know, that's just. You're just repeating the same bad formula over and over. So I think it was smart that they decided to keep with Marvel their little partnership. And if they don't watch out, at some point Disney's going to buy Sony and we're not going to have to worry about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's, and that was Mike Candy, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.